Hello everyone and welcome back to another insightful episode of our podcast series. I am Dr. Harshita, your host for today's discussion. Joining us is the esteemed Dr. Vishwanath Nadesh, an ENT specialist renowned for his expertise in sinusitis management. Today we are delving into a crucial topic that affects millions worldwide, airway allergy and we'll explore the challenges, advancements and solutions surrounding airway allergies. Welcome Dr. Uh, good morning Dr. Harshita. Thank you very much for inviting me to your forum and it would be a pleasure to answer your questions and spend some time with you uh, delving into the very common topic of uh, airway allergy, especially nasal allergy and asthma. Yes Doctor, it's great to have you here. So uh, let's dive right in. So, Doctor, in your extensive experience, what are the key challenges healthcare professionals face when trying to differentiate between allergic and non-allergic airway conditions? And how do you recommend overcoming these challenges? Okay, so Dr. Hashita, this is a very pertinent question because these days airway allergies are increasingly getting very common in our experience. Uh, in day-to-day -day practice, almost up to 20 to 30 percent of the case load involved such cases. So when we say uh, airway allergies or rhinitis, uh, this is basically a group of heterogeneous disorders, which is classified by, uh, which is due to inflammation of the nasal airway or the inflammation of the lower airways. And the characteristic features of both allergic or non-allergic uh, condition is uh, basically nasal obstruction or congestion, nasal discharge, sneezing as well as itching. So these are uh, three or four main, you know, uh, very pertinent, very common symptoms which accompany uh, these conditions. Now, uh, I must tell you here that in both allergic as well as non-allergic condition, these symptoms are there. So it becomes very really difficult uh, for an untrained uh, eye or an untrained person uh, to differentiate whether this is because of allergy or this is a non-allergic non condition. These conditions, uh, you know, produce a myriad of quality of life uh, issues and, you know, uh, they are a huge burden on the healthcare system. So it is important for us to recognize these conditions properly and treat them properly. So when I say uh, treat them uh, properly, uh, the most important thing here is a good, very good history. A good history and a good clinical examination, you know, uh, clinches the um, diagnosis in favor of allergic or non-allergic condition uh, in up to 90% of the cases. So, uh, when I talk of uh, history and clinical examination, it is the pattern uh, of the disease which is important. It is the seasonality of the disease uh, occurrence which is important. Uh, it is the response to medication, again, which, you know, which will give us an idea whether it is allergic or non-allergic. And again, the coexisting conditions uh, with uh, these conditions uh, is very important uh, to recognize us or to differentiate um, that the thing is allergic or non-allergic. Now, um, allergic conditions are basically immunoglobin IgE mediated. It is very important to recognize here. And out of the total cases, about 45% are because of allergic conditions, about 23% are because of non-allergic conditions and about 34% are there which are uh, actually mixed uh, in nature. That is both allergic as well as non-allergic uh, thing gets mixed up. So as far as the allergic airway diseases are concerned, uh, when we see, look at the onset of these diseases, it is, it is quite early in life. You know, they follow a very uh, distinct seasonal pattern. Uh, when we see uh, aggravations in a particular season, the waxing and waning uh, of these problems, then the symptoms of itching and sneezing, which are mediated by the allergic uh, chemical mediators like um, histamine, uh, they are more prominent or more pronounced in allergic conditions. Then uh, the aggravation of symptoms, especially uh, indoors or outdoors, now when the patient is exposed to certain allerg allergens is again an indicator. Uh, towards it being allergic. Uh, when we look uh, look at non-allergic conditions, they mostly develop later in the life, the third decade or the fourth decade. They don't follow uh, any seasonal pattern. They don't wax and when they are mostly persistent. Once they start affecting a patient, they will persist. 
these symptoms, uh, uh, these conditions are non-Ig mediated, and uh, the chemical mediators like histamine are not generally involved in these conditions. They are basically due to hyper responsiveness or hyper reactivity to certain non-specific stimuli. This could be a strong smell or certain kinds of food uh, like very spicy food. This could be because of uh, change in temperature, change in humidity levels, or it, or even smoke. All these conditions, you know, they act as basically act as an irritant uh, to the airway mucosa and produce certain symptoms. Not only these um, uh, conditions, but there are certain other uh, things which also affect uh, the non-allergic uh, airway diseases like infections. They are very common, especially after viral infections. Then. Uh, you know, uh, problems with the autonomic nervous system, they can produce a condition called vasomotor rhinitis, which, you know, mimics uh, allergic rhinitis in a big way. Then uh, we can have symptoms because of uh, drugs, because of medication which we take. There is a condition called uh, rhinitis medicamentosa. Uh, this happens due to overuse of nasal decongestants. Then uh, NSAIDs, uh, the common painkillers which we take, antihypertensives, uh, in females, especially oral contraceptives or hormonal medication, you know, these induce symptoms of uh, non-allergic rhinitis. Then certain occupations when we are exposed to particulate matter, diesel exhaust, or uh, we are exposed to, you know, um, pollutants, then also um, uh, these conditions can happen. So, yeah, basically, uh, when we go through the history, um, the clinical examination, uh, we can generally make out uh, on on the basis of a good history that whether this patient is having symptoms because of allergy or it is because of a non-allergic condition. Yes. So uh, now, doctor, uh, could you also elaborate on the role of allergy tests in clinical practice in helping to distinguish between allergic and non-allergic airway conditions? And how are these tests utilized in clinical practice? Okay, so, um, you know, uh, there are hundreds of allergens which we, which a person can uh, be allergic to, uh, which can produce the symptoms. So, basically, if we follow a simple uh, algorithm, the skin prick tests are the, you know, basis of diagnosing allergic condition or diagnosing an allergen to which a person is allergic to. So, these are basically IgE-mediated hypersensitivity reaction to an allergen. And they cause uh, an isnophilic infiltration of the uh, airway mucosa and produce the, uh, you know, uh, specific symptoms. Now, allergen is basically a protein. You can you can either inhale it, uh, or it can directly come in contact with your skin, or you can even ingest when you ingest, uh, like in cases of food allergy, these symptoms are produced. Now, uh, when the patient gets uh, repeatedly, um, you know, exposed to these allergen and get sensitized, an Ig mediated reaction occurs which produces symptoms due to the various chemical mediators of allergy. Now, when we do the skin prick test and it is positive, uh, generally it is uh, an allergic condition. Now, if the skin prick test is not positive, then we start thinking about non-allergic conditions which cause the airway allergy. We can take a nasal smear and there is abundant isnophil in the nasal smear and the skin prick test is negative, then probably it is a condition called um, allergic, non-allergic rhinitis with isnophilic uh, syndrome. Then if the nasal isnophils are negative, then it could be something to do with the uh, dysregulation uh, of autonomic nervous system, which uh, produces vasomotor rhinitis. Now, allergic skin testing is the, you know, base which helps us diagnose various allergic conditions. Uh, in this, uh, you know, specific allergens are introduced into the skin and uh, say in about uh, 15 to 20 seconds, a wheel and flare reaction is there, which is studied and which gives us an idea whether this patient is allergic to uh, a certain allergen or not. Uh, the skin prick test is uh, basically an intradermal uh, skin prick test or an epicutaneous uh, skin prick test. These tests basically are very good they are cost effective, immediately give us the uh, results and then we can accordingly decide uh, on the basis of the results how to go about with the treatment of these uh, patients. Some patients uh, 
may not like to undergo a skin prick test or there can be certain conditions like severe eczema where uh, skin prick uh, cannot be done then we can do the specific um, ig testing because at the end of the day all allergy related uh, conditions are mediated by the immunoglobulin ig so specific ig and a total ig in the serum these uh, give us an idea of uh, the allergic uh, allergens the patient is exposed to and accordingly decide our treatment but i must say there is nothing like a good skin prick test the serum uh, ig and the specific ig tests are uh, costly they, they do not give you immediate uh, results and they are not as good as skin prick test in uh, diagnosing uh, these conditions they, sometimes we can do the basophil activation test also but then uh, the best and the gold standard is obviously the uh, skin prick test yeah thank you dr nitesh for the comprehensive explanation and now moving on to diagnostic tools how do imaging modalities such as ct scans or bronchoscopies contribute to distinguishing between allergic and non allergic airway conditions and when are these tests typically warranted in the diagnostic process so as i told you skin prick test are the test which uh, you know um, basically help us in diagnosing uh, allergic and non allergic conditions as you mean uh, when you mention bronchoscopies or um, ct scans so they are basically for the other end of um, this problem when we are anticipating a complication uh, or the disease has progressed and some complications have formed like a severe acute uh, allergic uh, condition changing into acute sinus or chronic sinus disease with polyposis so to know the extent of the disease plan further management to know the disease burden uh, we do a ct scan ct scan also helps us in pre operative planning uh, our pre operative planning so that we can accordingly plan our surg surgical you know mapping uh, when we do a ct scan bronchoscopy is again don't have a big role uh, yeah maybe for lower airway complications to take samples and to assess uh, the airway integrity and all we can do but these are not commonly done uh, skin prick tests good enough and endoscopies like nasal endoscopy or laryngoscopy to assess the uh, nasal uh, mucosa assess the complications uh, they are good enough routinely no we don't uh, really go in for uh, scans or uh, Uh, bronchoscopies okay and uh, now let's uh, talk about the treatments part so uh, what new treatments are available for uh, severe airway allergies that don't respond to regular therapies so allergy as we all know is because of an allergen so the best way is to avoid them and the good old uh, as far as the uh, medical management is concerned good old antihistaminics and intranasal corticosteroids are always there and they are quite good enough uh, to manage uh, most of the cases but yeah but yeah obviously when um, there are complications the di disease is very um, extensive there are a lot of allergens involved and the patient in some way or other cannot avoid the allergens uh, sometimes we see cases which don't respond very well to even medical management and the patient has perennial symptoms symptoms all the time has a poor quality of life sleep is affected so in those cases newer medications are there we can you we have intranasal antihistaminics the onset of action is within 15 to 30 minutes uh, they do very well in certain subset of patients then leukotriene receptor antagonists uh, antagonists are there which are again uh, very helpful in managing um, difficult cases intranasal sodium chromoglycate is there but uh, a certain uh, subset of patients um, with who are really really uh, in a bad state have severe symptoms now we have immunomodulators also now we have monoclonal anti ig um, substances like omelizumab you know uh, which we, we can use um, uh, for these patients then we have dupilumab which is an il4 receptor antagonist these new agents you know uh, they uh, have very promising results um, in the long run also and uh, latest data shows a um, uh, lot of uh, efficacy of these products in managing um, resistant cases of uh, allergic airway diseases and the response to this medication is really really dramatic the patient uh, especially the sense of smell or obstruction 
or um, the control of nasal polyposis is uh, really really very good uh, one of the most important you know limiting factors for this medication is the cost uh, because of the cost uh, we cannot use uh, them in all the patients but yes whenever they are indicated and uh, if possible if possible to use they are wonderful um, you know tools in managing uh, severe and, and persistent airway issues yeah uh, incredible to hear about these advancements doctor and finally with environmental factors like pollution and climate change contributing to more airway allergies what steps do you think are crucial for preventing and managing these conditions on a public health level so um, as we know increasing urbanization has um, you know produced a lot of changes in our lifestyle um in the air we, air which we breathe you know people will be surprised to know that we inhale almost 10000 liters of um, air every day uh, so it is not surprising uh, that uh, the quality of air which we breathe you know affects our, our lungs uh, and our health overall so when you breathe so much of air so the quality of air really becomes very important but with um, you know rapidly increasing urbanization the air which we breathe has really deteriorated and uh, the quality of air has arguably become a very important factor in you know uh, that these disease becoming more and more common um, as we see so just to give you a small example in uh, 1819 uh, it was john bostock who first uh, described uh, allergic rhinitis and when he was just um, collecting cases uh, it took him 9 years to collect uh, just 27 cases so that was in 1890s now if we come to our times today allergic rhinitis is very very common um, it affects up as i said up to 20 to 30% of the population and such rapid growth in um, allergic airway diseases just cannot be you know attributed to genetic factors obviously there is something which is you know pumping up the number of cases which we see and uh, mm, because of the factors like increasing air pollution uh, ambient air pollution the prevalence of even uh, this is like asthma which was just 1% in uh, uh, in 1950s has gone up to uh, almost up to 15% now so that is the you know uh, the pyramid how it has uh, increased so um, as we see that uh, there is an increasing trend uh, trend in our change in lifestyle in urbanization in the uh, in our you know tools which uh, which we with uh, progress of life which we have taken up uh, it has increased air pollution and induced changes in our immune system which has you know given rise to a lot of um, allergic diseases so creating uh, public health awareness is very very important how we live um, and how we should uh, keep our environment clean and when I, when i say environment it's not only outdoor environment its indoor environment is equally important uh, uh, both indoor and outdoor allergens play a vital role in you know pumping up the cases of allergy so people should realize the harmful effect of air pollution and climate change uh, it will also help uh, to prevent um, to develop preventive measures uh, when we sensitize people at local level at regional level and national levels and we should have protocols strict guidelines in every sphere of life so that we can uh, play an important role play a vital role in reducing the effect of uh, climate change or air pollution in uh, our day to day life and eventually we can see that this will you know help in uh, decreasing the the number of allergy cases or the number of airway allergies which we see in our day to day practice yes absolutely dr nitesh Uh, so thank you uh, for sharing your invaluable insights on this critical topic it's been a pleasure having you on our podcast yeah, dr ashutosh the pleasure was mine and thank you very much again for inviting me to your forum thank you very much thank you doctor and to our listeners thank you for tuning in and before we conclude i encourage all healthcare professionals to explore the medsynapse platform it offers a unique opportunity to engage in enriching discussions connect with esteemed medical professionals and contribute to the progress of healthcare until next time take care stay healthy goodbye